So, my name is Justin Reif. For those of you that don't know, I am the pastor of addiction recovery here at the warehouse. Um, I say this every time. I don't say this to boast. I say this to, to look at the contrast of what the world would, would have me be and what the king would have me be. So in the world's view, I am a convicted felon. I have felonies for drug charges. I don't have a high school education. <laughs> I dropped out my sophomore year and never got a GED. I drive a vehicle that's 27 years old. It doesn't have a radio or even power steering. That's what the world would have me look like. But Jesus would say that I am a, a child of the redeemed. I am no longer called these things that the world would have me be called. I am a child of the king. And I have been given a task to bring um, another one of these Christmas unknowns to you guys. So it was started. Kyle had Mary. Hank had Joseph. They left me with the innkeeper. <laughs> so those of you that have read the Christmas story, the word innkeeper isn't even in there. This guy's name is not in there. In fact, it's nowhere to be found. So let's read that text, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. At that time, Emperor Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. When this first census took place, Quirinus, with its governor of Syria, everyone then went to register himself, each to his own hometown. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David. Joseph went there because he was a descendant of David. He went to register with Mary, who was promised in marriage to him. She was pregnant, and while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have her baby. She gave birth to her first son, wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in a manger for there was no room for them to stay in the inn. That right there is the mentioning of the innkeeper, for there was no room for them to stay in the inn. Now, in my research in this and looking through this, Bethlehem would not have had a Motel 6. There would not have been this bed and breakfast on the corner for them to book. Literally, the inn translated to a spare room in, in a, a family member's house. So they get to, to this, this family member's house, and it's full. They've already got family members lodged in this room. There's nothing they can do. So they're forced to go to the barn. Now, we don't know what was going on in this innkeeper's mind at that, that night that he turned them away, or so the scripture would have you believe he turned them away. We don't know what was going on. I think it's interesting that somebody that's never even mentioned always has a part in a Christmas play. There's always the part of the innkeeper in a Christmas play, and it was somebody that was never mentioned. Something else that's interesting to think about is at this time, the census was going on. So this would have meant that Joseph wouldn't have been the only person going back to his hometown for this census. This town would have been completely full of people. Completely, I picture it as this chaotic, you know, if they didn't have a place to stay, how many other people were left sleeping in barns and laying in outbuildings and sleeping on the floor? You know, some commentators said that this could be related to Black Friday. Now, I'm not talking Black Friday this year. I'm talking like post-COVID Black Friday. Like, Mary and Joseph would have gotten beat up for a TV in this, in this situation. Like, they would have been rushing to find this room and they would have been met by this mob of people breaking windows and taking whatever they wanted, like this, this chaotic scene. And they're left to sleep in a barn. Scripture tells us that there was no room in this inn. And most Christmas plays will tell you that the, the innkeeper turned them away. Now you picture this, if you can add in that, that little Black Friday mix, how many other family members did he turn away that night? And then here comes this family knocking on the door again. Like, again, I don't have the room. I don't know what to tell you people. Everybody paints this negative picture on this innkeeper. They all, we all have this, this, little, this little thought in our head of this guy turning Jesus away. Some commentators say he was the first person to ever miss Christmas. 
But I'm here to tell you that, that that guy didn't know that that was Jesus. It wasn't made known to him, right? If it was made known to him that this child was going to be the son of God, do you think he would have pushed him off in a barn? I'm pretty sure he would have woken up whoever he had in that spare room and was like, look, guys, we got somebody that's ranked a little bit higher than you. He turned him away and he didn't even know it. I'm here to stand in front of you today and tell you that we all turn him away and we know him. How many times has he knocked at our door and we just draw those curtains a little bit tighter? You know, just turn that deadbolt. Not right now. How many different doors is he knocking on? I can tell you right now, each one of you have pictured a door that he's knocking on that you won't let him in, myself included. You know, it's this blatant turning away, this blatant disobedience. You know, we blame the innkeeper for this. He didn't even know what he was doing. We know what we're doing. And we do it on a daily basis. I'm going to share a story this morning that, that talks about going against the voice of God and shutting that door when he's knocking on that door. So this would have been 2016, early 2017. I graduated a program in 2015. I come home. I've got a job. Where I'm working. Jenny and I found a house, starting to build our life back together after a 15-year-long rampant drug addiction that, that almost ruined us. And we're trying to navigate what this looks like, okay? Jenny has back conditions that require pain medicine. Pain medicine is my Achilles heel. So how do you navigate keeping medicine in a house where there's a chance that there will be temptation? There's a chance that I'm gonna find them, that I'm gonna manipulate the situation and I'm gonna get what I want. So after careful prayer and, and consultation, we decided that the best thing to do would be to get a safe. Jenny can purchase a safe. I won't even be included in the sale. I wouldn't even know the combination, right? It's the perfect win-win. She doesn't have to hide her stuff anymore. I have absolutely no access to it, and everything is great. So we get the safe. She purchases it, and we start doing that, and it's working just great, like... I've been very manipulative in my life, and I've done a lot of shady things, but safe cracking is not my forte, I will tell you that. <laughs> so, here's where I get home from work, and I have that thought, well, what, what, if, I, what if I could get in that safe? And then that, the, the instant shutdown of, no, 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 that's a bad idea, that's a bad idea. That was that knock at the door. That was Jesus knocking on that door. Hey, let's not do that. We don't need to do that. Let's not do that. And I just drawed that curtain just a little bit tighter. No, we can figure this out. We can figure out how to get in this safe. And then again, there's that gentle nudge from Jesus. Like, I, I felt it. Don't do that. Don't do that. The next day, I hear the numbers start to rattle on the safe. And I get up, and I run into the kitchen, and I'm like blatantly peeking over her shoulder. Ah, I'm going to look at this number. And she, I was like, oh, I'm just kidding. You know what I mean? But I caught the second number. This went on for a couple more weeks. And I followed her in. I knew she was going in to get her medicine. I followed her in. And I watched as she clicked the first number. So I now had the first and second number. Thought, okay, now I just got to manipulate my way in to get that third number. And that's when the, that knock at the door again. You sure this is what you want to do, Justin? You want to throw away these couple years of sobriety? This is what you want to do? So what did my flesh do? What did my, my humanness do? So we deadbolted that door. We're not going to answer that door right now. We'll let, we'll let him in that door later. But right now, he doesn't need to be involved in what's going on right now. The next day, come home, she's clicking in the safe, and I walk by, she's got the safe open, she's getting her medicine. I go to the sink to wash my hands, and I look back at the dial with it open, would have been stuck on the last number. I now had all three numbers to open this safe. The rush that came over me in that moment was indescribable. 
it was such a roaring conflict of knowing that I should not be doing what I'm doing, but every fiber of my being wanting to do what I am doing. I waited. I couldn't even guess, muster up the strength to do it that night. I waited until the next day. I came home from work. I did the numbers in the safe, and the handle opened. I had done it. I had figured it out. This is this flawless plan, right? Like now she thinks she's missing pills. She's just crazy. There's no way I can crack a safe. I've got the perfect alibi. I've got the perfect excuse. Game on. I pulled it open. I pulled her bottle of pills out, and I took three of them. And I swallowed them. The burning that I felt from taking those pills was another feeling that was indescribable. The conviction that swept over me was so fierce and so intense that I burst into tears. I immediately started sobbing. I was sobbing when she got home from work. I immediately told her what I had done. I could not live like this. This was through this whole situation, I can remember it now vividly, of Jesus knocking at that door and me just pushing it back closed. Doing what I didn't want to do, but at the same time, doing what I wanted to do. Galatians 5.17 says, For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants. And what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies. And this means that you cannot do what you want to do. What are you continuing to do right now that you don't want to do? Now, I laid out this big extravagant thing. This is a big bad relapse. This is this big pivotal turn point in my life. But there's little things right now that he's asking of me to open the door. What door is he asking you guys to open this morning that you're still not willing to open? What door is it that you're will not even so not willing to open it, you're not even willing to open the blinds? Another tough question is, who is God sending to your door? Who are the people in your lives that God is sending to knock on your door and you're just simply not letting them in? You know these people. We're, we're all picturing them right now. I'm here to tell you that, you know, Hank had made mention last week, and it's such a beautiful phrase, of who is waiting on the other side of your obedience. You're accepting this call, you're opening this door, may not even be for you. It may be for somebody down the line that is waiting to meet Jesus through you or through somebody that you have taught Jesus to. Something else that I'm going to say that we don't really like to hear is our obedience isn't even necessarily for our own benefit. I'm going to say that again. Us being obedient may not even be for our own benefit. It may not feel nice. It may not feel right. But it's necessary. That day, my obedience and not taking those pills, I turned against, I was disobedient. It was not fun to have to be obedient and tell on myself. But it was necessary. That is the obedience. Who is waiting on the other side of your obedience? I want to talk about another story in the Bible. Of, I'm using this a little metaphorically with the door being opened and you know, I, th I think in, my, in myself, speaking in myself, there's multiple doors that, that Jesus wants me to open. There's multiple doors that he wants to come into and be a part of and, and, and come alongside me in my life. And I'm willing to open about 90% of those doors. And just standing here being transparent with you, there's 10% of those doors that I don't know that I want to open yet. I don't, know that, I don't know that I can deal with the shame that comes with opening them just yet. But we're working on it. So this story, you can find this in Luke 18, chapter, or chapter 18, verse 18. A Jewish leader asked Jesus, good teacher, 
What must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Respect your father and your mother. The man replied, ever since I, have, I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. See, these are the doors he was willing to let him in on. These are the doors that he willingly opened. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there's still one more thing you need to do. Sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very rich. That's that door he wasn't willing to open. That's that one that he closed the blinds a little bit tighter on. Jesus saw he was sad and said, How hard is it for rich people to enter the kingdom of God? It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. This man had one door he wasn't willing to open. Or in the name of this, ser this sermon, missed call. He had one call he just was not willing to answer. What's the one call that you're not willing to answer? I implore you, looking at this through the goggles of Celebrate Recovery, to pick that one thing. Pick that one door that you don't want to open. Just one. We all have many. Pick one and get started. Hebrews 12.1 says, As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and the sin which holds on to us so tightly, and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. I picked this verse in my research. This verse stuck out to me. And it's the first part of it that says, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way. It goes on to say, and the sin that so tightly entangles. But in the beginning, it says, the stuff that gets in the way. I want to I focus on this, this stuff that gets in the way, because I think this stuff that gets in the way is preventing us from opening doors today. I think this stuff that gets in the way is not necessarily sinful. It's not bad. It's good stuff. But I think it gets in the way of opening the door. A big one these days uh, for me is social media. It's not sinful to be on social media, guys. It's not sinful to scroll through Facebook. It's not sinful to scroll through TikTok. But what door aren't you opening because you're leaving this door open? What door is this social media becoming that curtain that you just close over? You can still see out, but we're not opening that door. You know, a couple questions here this morning is what's getting in the way? What are those things that are getting in the way for you personally? What's causing you to miss the call? Look, I'm sure everybody in here would agree with me that God has a calling on each one of our lives. And, and we all are working out our salvation in this calling. But I feel like we're all missing doors that he's knocking on. I feel like we could all be one step closer to finishing that race if we were willing to open the necessary doors. This last scripture I'm going to share with us is wrong in your bulletin. I did that. It's my fault. Uh, I did Romans 12.1. I wanted Romans 12.2. It is right on the screen. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. Look, sometimes transforming your mind is, is the self-realization that you're letting things get in, get in the way. You know, I, I used to look at this scripture and think, well, this means I've got to completely think about things differently now. Like, I've got to change everything I've ever thought of and think about it this way. No. 
Sometimes that means that self-realization of, hey, I'm missing the mark in these areas, and this is a perfect place to start. Pick that one door and open that door. I'd like the band to come back up. So when it comes to this change and this renewal of your mind, you cannot do this alone. It is necessary to open that door and let Jesus in. Something else that's just as necessary when opening that door is knowing where you stand and knowing what you look like in the eyes of Jesus. Knowing where you're missing the mark, because Jesus knows where you're missing the mark. And you need to realize that, you know, change only comes when the pain of the present outweighs the fear of the future. And I think the pain of the present would be just a little bit more if we saw ourselves who we we really are. And we're people that close the door. We're not people that open the door. Our human nature wants us to close that door. I'm here to tell you to open that door and look at yourself the way Jesus looks at you, a sinner in need of help. Change cannot happen on your own. Change can only happen when you let that person in the door and you have to understand what needs to change, right? So these bad things, these things that are hindering you, that are causing you to slow down and lose that race, You've got to be real and vulnerable and honest with yourself and lay these things out at that door. Like, this is not, oh, yeah, I am kind of bad. No, lay these things out at the door. I'm watching a show on Hulu right now. There's about the rise and fall of OxyContin. And this was something that was misbranded. It was mislabeled. It was labeled as the safest narcotic in the world. It was marketed for headaches for aches and pains. And it was just as dangerous as any other narcotic out there. But the real change didn't come until we were able to recognize that this was mislabeled, this is misbranded. This isn't this knight in shining armor. This is a broken pill. Just like us, we are not Jesus. We are a broken vessel in need of Jesus. Stand with me. (laughs) Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the message that you've prepared today, Lord. And I just ask, as each one of us leave this place today, and as we sing this last song, Lord, that you would just help us to recognize the doors that we're continuing to close. Lord, I ask you to just bring them to the forefront of our mind, Lord, and give us the key to open these doors. And just help us to allow you to step in and take charge. In Jesus' name, amen.